TikTok has always been white. Asian reveal. Bleached. Depigmatized. Concocted. Algorithmically colonized. We've been watching the Snow Succubi schlop the ever living aura out of short form algorithms since its curation. Guys, it's time to stop the conversation. TikTok was getting the best. Huh? And obviously, as the chief captain of Black Affairs First Command, no nonchalant dreadhead, cornbread pink hair person, South Sudan Wayye Manwin, the biggest hoe of Canadian politics, you know that every once in a while, I have to act as the noticer. Let me first get across though that TikTok is not as nebulous as it sounds. No matter what the unks still using Facebook say, let them live in bliss. Facebook is such a wholesome community for 70 year olds with dental benefits. Grouping TikTok as a whole would be to categorize billions of views a month under a racial reference which spans across multiple genres. I mean in August 2024, TikTok hit 1 billion viewers. So to define a whole diaspora, including creators from South Africa, Kenya, Korea, Japan, Brazil, India. By commodifying a diverse array of genres, black creators slash viewers populate what they're watching and how they consume it just wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't make sense at all. I mean, there's geek, nerd, anime, cosplay, whatever you want to call it, TikTok. Occupied by amazing cosplayers, fantastic editors, and very hot femmes like do they make y'all in the beautiful factory? The 10 out of 10 heavenly woman creator simulator device. That's where y'all are made. <laughs> There's socio slash poly TikTok. Where do you find reliable progressive news? Encompassing intuitive and intelligent arrays of voices who I actually started with before I got banned 90 times. We'll get to that later though. Dancing TikTok, underground TikTok, edit talk, book talk. You could really go niche and say hope core TikTok, spiritual TikTok, shift talk, and Roblox talk, dress to impress, dress to impress pose four, dress to impress pose Five, just to impress pose, six. <laughs> I mean, there's even a convoluted side of TikTok dedicated to a particular video game in which viral videos on TikTok cross over and empower role play by using black instances of trauma seen in drill rap to parody gang shootings because some guy named Trayvon was shot up at a, at a digital house party. It gets weird in the dohood niche. Black content, especially on TikTok, comes in all shapes, forms, and sizes. It doesn't fit into one binary. The only thing that really interlinks us most is the most beautiful thing in the world. Racism, 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 racism. Yay! Woo! Man, I've been waiting all day for this. Racism, the, the future, the future of the, the world. Woo! Yay! Oh, you don't think it's beautiful? The story of the black TikTok artists will go on to cement the legacies of a number of notable Gen Z influencers. Wisdom with as much high fashion collabs, million view videos, and certainly millions of more subscribers that talented man will garnish would never have had the platform he did if TikTok didn't exist. Bright political minds springing into the forefront of discourse like JJ, Conscious Lee, Think Peace Tribe, and Samoya wouldn't be around without TikTok. Quirky, weird, funny, entertaining black people. I mean, TikTok has literally done the work of Hollywood in terms of introducing a diverse collective of black artists. I mean, when I say I-T-G-I-R-L or pose like this and it's been a about video a month and a half or, since I've given anything a 10 or threaten to drop new music by running at the camera and yelling <laughs> hello Christ or even say the name lip gloss come here people who have been tapped into the community on that app for its last five year runtime know exactly what I'm talking about this app has so much lore so much black joy so much next generational talent but is our creativity a tool for entertainment? Is the black creator really seen in the eight second algorithm? And if not, how does TikTok prioritize the creator? Stay with me now. I'm sure we've all heard the story of Charlie D'Amelio stealing a dance from a young black woman, cementing her platform as TikTok's most followed artist the for a couple of years. The paradox of black and white content creation show us a clear parallel on prejudice we have yet to fully unpack. At the end of the day, is our culture on TikTok.com expendable? I mean, obviously not. Black people run the music trends dating all the way back from Baby Santana to Koyla Ray to modern day Tissa Korean. Black people run the online trends from the comment section's backwards culture of utilizing AAVE. <laughs> Y'all co-opted black vernacular. <laughs> Goofy. <laughs> <laughs> and marginalized artists across all applicable slur lines have surely had to thank TikTok for a number of their come up stories. Aaliyah interludes eccentric fits started off with her just being real on TikTok. Kabi went from a factory worker to the most watched short form content creator ever 
Saucy Santana, Material Gro- Material Gro- You can get niche and say Ro Ramden, Turb, a number of other video essayists, Mustangs of a Crouton, Underground Rap, including Chris, Iaz, Pink Panthers, Worst Life, dancers like Auntie Nasha, funny people like Karma Pilled, musicians like Devilish Bree, Gap Tooth, Mazel Fire. And this is only like a third of a list of people I know. You could go on and on and on and on. At least in my pink. Don't my go pink chasing opinion. waterfalls. <laughs> now imagine me as the Sphinx at the gates of rhetorical nirvana. I'm here to ask you some questions. You may not be satisfied with an answer. You may not even get an answer, but the utility of TikTok needs to be discussed. Since TikTok is still an app developing and growing even beyond what I or anyone believed expected back in 2020, please don't take me as a definite. While I'm talking, try to have a conversation with me, please. I don't bite. Have this internal dialogue. We could, we could have a conversation. Again! It's been two whole years since I've been a consistent TikTok content creator. The algorithm has evolved without me. In fact, I'm bigger on YouTube now than I ever was on TikTok at about 9k subscribers. Help us. Help us. I've even been a YouTuber for the same amount of time I've been a TikToker. Black art on TikTok is carried by thousands of individual creative minds. To slap a label on all black art ever created and summarize it in vanity is not the purpose of this video. I'm simply a creator that wants to center experiences, people, and vibes I find amusing, entertaining, or educational. And to talk about it on camera while looking like a slut is fun. Did, did you forget how to have fun, my child? It's 6 p.m., the sun is setting, and you haven't even had your seven hugs needed, my dear. Kalas, come here. Sponsored by Warm. I also believe, however, that my grievances are indicative of real problems that real barriers of internet moderation and centralization bring to the black creator diaspora. So be demure, grab your Corvette Corvette, riz your theory and wife, nonchalant dreadhead. It's time to mog this app. Now there's a specific intersection with the internet, black art, and algorithmization that we have to delve into. Today, the glaring gaps between egalitarian principles and inequitable practices is filled with subtler forms of discrimination that give the illusion of progress and neutrality, even as coded inequity makes it easier and faster to produce racist outcomes. This quote by Ruha Benjamin comes from Race and Technology. She alludes to the manufactured forms of racism and algorithmic bias structurally manifested from societal normativity in order to highlight how codes can be racist in themselves. Remember that humans make codes, human drive algorithms, and as indifferent as we think technology is on a philosophical level, actually, we don't really think it's that indifferent. There's a lot of studies pertaining into how robots could have like some type of- Race sense. After Technology looks at the social dimensions of the data sciences, algorithmic discrimination, machine bias. And I got interested in it because a few years ago, I was noticing these headlines around so-called racist robots. There seemed to be surprise around this idea that technology is not neutral. And so what the book tries to do is not only look at emerging technologies, but the longer history of science and technology as embedded in a social context. A few years ago, there was a viral video of two friends using an automated soap dispenser, and the soap wouldn't come out with the individual with darker skin because darker skin absorbs light. So if it's infrared technology, it's not going to work as effectively. And so I use this kind of lower tech example to get us thinking about more complex systems like our criminal justice system, our healthcare system, education system, where a lot of these institutions are outsourcing human decisions and turning to risk assessment assessment tool. An indifferent tool can still have racist connotations in its application. See, algorithms inherently, whether you like it or not, categorize artists based off of a myriad of interconnected moderational coding. One of these boxes of algorithmic filtration includes gender. In a paper called Gendering Algorithms in Social Media, Edward, Adam, Roger, and Bart tackle how backwards the idea of internet categorization can be in relation to gendered bias. Online and social media platform providers use users' traits, including name, age, and gender to improve user experience and personalize online behavioral advertising. By knowing users' characteristics, corporations can target or exclude certain groups more efficiently, tailor their services to certain users, and increase the time they spend on the platform. In such a way, profiling makes marketing more precise and effective. However, a growing concern is the increasing use of opaque inferential analytics that reveal sensitive user attributes that serve attention economies, and that may reinforce existing biases which, although not explicit, 
can be very influential. A recurrent bias is gendered stereotyping. Gendered stereotyping refers to the practice of ascribing to an individual specific attributes, characteristics, or roles by reason, woman or man, only of their membership in the social group of women or men. However, gendered stereotyping is a complex process that, although grounded in strong beliefs of what a gender is and should be, is both used and understood in a too simplistic manner. I mean, gendered bias is the reason why a lot of toxic men's internet spaces continue to grow. Algorithms inherently feed into what you watch from beginning to end by creating a space for misogynistic thought men like Andrew Tate, who can ride the algorithm's good graces in terms of retention and develop a following through the same toxic ideations of other men surrounding him online. I mean, through this past year, even though he's been banned off of a myriad of apps, he's still somehow taken over TikTok and Instagram short form spaces. I mean, if, if you were a boy, enjoy your gym, philosophical, or, or of the stoic rhetoric, chances are you'd have to see this, this Rufus if he did Kyle Ken and never met a red hair baddie. So there is indeed a gendered bias, which makes content creation intensely harder for black femmes in relation to content creation. Even black can have an asterisk. And I have reason to believe this is purposeful. Now for this section, I'm gonna dissect the experience of the black creator, along with codified bigotry pertaining to gender and race using individual stories, research papers, and my own understanding of the internet. Our ability to examine biases towards black users and creators within the TikTok algorithm itself is limited. And thus we focus this work on the perceptions of black creators. However, plenty of existing work has identified and labored to mitigate biases and algorithms like those powering social media platforms. For example, Harrison conducted qualitative and quantitative analyses to identify populations that are most likely to experience content moderation across a variety of social media platforms, including TikTok. They found that black users, transgender users, and users who promote conservative politics experience disproportionate removal of their social media content compared to other populations in their sample. Let me say that again. Black users, trans users, and conservatives. Now, what about a black thought is inherently as, as, as upsetting as a conservative thought, as a, a guy just going like, oh, I'm a Nazi. The balance of existence on the app of TikTok is kept in check by white content creators who have been centered since the beginning. The reason why the initial story of TikTok is so white is because the black creators on there were prohibited by other apps. In the new age of TikTok though, anyone can go viral. And not to say this couldn't always happen, but that phrase, anyone can go viral, takes away from the very real grievances of platform racism faced on the app. Outside of studying marginalized groups, Multiple works have studied the experience of TikTok users more generally. For instance, Lee studied user perceptions of the TikTok algorithm. They find that many users perceive the algorithm to accurately reflect their multifaceted interests with little effort, while some users needed to make additional efforts to shape their For You page outside of typical engagements with content. Multiple participants found that their feed lacked diversity. Interestingly, one white user in the study noted that they made a deliberate effort to search and like content from black creators and other creators of color which helped to diversify their feed. Explore algorithm folk theories, identifying a commonly held theory, which they call identity strainer theory, in which users believe content is actively suppressed based on marginalized identities, such as race and ethnicity, body size and physical appearance, ability, status, or LGBTQ identity. They further propose the concept of algorithmic representational harm to describe the harm that occurs when users embody these identities. I really need y'all to understand how fucked up it feels to be a black creator, giving your all to your content, knowing that the algorithms are literally working against you. I've seen multiple black creators recently who have theorized, tested, and proved that not only does the algorithm read the color of your skin, but it will also give palm colored creators more views per likes than if you are brown skinted. I already know there's gonna be multiple people in the comments that are like, deny, deny, deny. But like I said, it's been tested and proven by multiple creators. And then this whole shit with the Black Panther red carpet happened. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, they had like, no black female creators invited to that carpet. Not even the ones that are like way up there who have done several other press events and the ones who did get invited were invited the day of. It's just so discouraging that you can fight tooth and fucking nail to earn your spot. You could work twice as hard and be three times as talented and still not get half the recognition of your white counterparts. Just because you're black. I've already talked about this before, but black creators statistically get paid 30% less than their white counterparts of like the same size. And it's like, we talk and talk and talk about this shit and nothing changes. Like, what is it gonna fucking take when you know 
the algorithm's already working against you, you're gonna get paid less and you won't be invited to the same events that, <laughs> that your white counterparts will. It's really fucking hard to keep wanting to do this. In another general study on TikTok content creators, Thomas and Keeley surveyed content creators to better understand their experience with hate speech and other toxic behavior, including stalking, toxic comments, and impersonation. Among their findings, 23% of their participants reported being the target of hate speech, bullying, or harassment, always or often. What TikTok has done is regulate the moderator as law, coded it to flag harmful behavior, then act like it's not doing anything because the moderation system works across the board in the same way with all the creators, supposedly. The problem is, black people might have different ways of speaking. Whiteness works with more than just a skin tone. Yes, the algorithm can read skin tone, but the algorithm also picks up on speech patterns. So if we want the Philly dances, if we want the Cali dances, if we want the New York dances, we should be able to have a system that moderates its slang too, without the need to police it. You see Content moderation extends to language, and language has colloquialism with race. If we want black people on this app, we're gonna have to build a system that can account for the English language it speaks without kicking it out. I'm sure you've been scrolling the For You page and came across some Philly dancers, some Milwaukee songs, New York fashion, news, Atlanta girls with the moon boots. We kind of got a swag to how we walk. And I think you'd be surprised to find out that something as minutely different as voice and speech patterns are being flagged as inappropriate in the algorithm. For black users, one contributing factor to these disproportionate removals could be the use of AAVE among black content creators and social media users. Prior research shows black social media users are more likely to have their speech be classified as hate speech or otherwise offensive speech by content moderation systems, more likely to be classified as negative sentiment in sentiment analysis systems, have higher word error rates in speech to text captioning, and broadly reported to have poor performance on natural language processing systems in general. This issue is particularly concerning for content moderation and speech-to-text transcription, which both play a role in online video content creation and sharing. While the propriety nature of TikTok prevents much of these types of analysis of their platform, it is well established that these anti-black biases can exist in machine learning systems like those powering TikTok. Firstly, accepting the neutrality of TikTok in its current form as an undecided algorithm would be to solidify the existence of racism as a norm on this app. With black content creators being so prevalent in the background, be it in its songs, white creators, lip sync, the trends people dance to, or the fashion that content creators outside of black culture mimic. We can't hide from the fact that there is a presence. The moderation system is policing it. And as a result, black creators suffer and white creators benefit from not having aspects of their culture like their voice, their tone of speech, skin, or their hair moderated by TikTok. This brings me to the concept of being a black creator. One thing I love a lot about black creatives is how well they combat a normative veil of subjectivity that asterisks the black identity comes with in a social sense. You know, although aspects like gendered bias <laughs> and social scrutiny keeps a lot of normal everyday people far, 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 far away from the aspect of even like wanting to be a creator because it's like so cringe in their head and they have to combat this thing of like, oh, I'm posting online. Everyone's posting online. These TikTok creators are destroying the idea of molds on the internet by being themselves. Like across niche communities on TikTok, notably Lele, Princess Psycho, and with other black femmes leading the charge. Black people flood to these niches in the same way a lot of older black folk from Gen Z found community on Facebook talking about Dragon Ball Z, Roblox, and black culture, or on Tumblr talking about Lord, or One Direction, Wattpads, or Backyard Again. I'm seeing the same problems of cringe subjectively placed on them though. You know, people who don't fit the characteristics of what they should be on the internet. The black femmes who are cosplayers, influencers, or notably in genres with popular popular white woman will always see a barrage of backlash. More specific to video sharing platforms, Emma McGuire examines how expressions of black girlhood become viral, profitable, and appropriated commodities through a case study of the platform Vine. McGuire uses the example of black teenager Kayla Newman, username Peaches Monroe, who created the viral phrase eyebrows on fleek in a Vine video that received over 116 million views. Hi, my name is Peaches Monroe and most people know me from starting the catchphrase eyebrows on fleek. Fleek mean it's on point. Like it looks good. Like now my eyebrows are on fleek. It took a week probably for like the celebrities to get a hold of it. I was on Twitter and I seen people kept tagging me. And so I click on it and I seen that Christina Milian and Nicki Minaj was arguing about pretty on fleek. People all in the comment section just had my name. How can you argue about this? And she's actually creator of fleek and you need to pay her. And why aren't you guys adding her and tagging her? And I'm just like, cause I don't say anything. 
And then actually by the time they were done, nobody was talking about Pretty on Fleek. So I saw a few brands use Fleek. I know Fabulous 21 for sure. Fleek was like on one of their shirts. H&M said Fleek had it on their shirt. I know a few hair companies. And I feel like if it wasn't for me in that video, that wouldn't be so popular at the time as it is now or to just be later on down the line. The phrase went on to be used for advertising and sold on merchandise by a myriad of companies and celebrities. While others built social and monetary capital from Newman's phrase, Newman attempted unsuccessfully to gain intellectual property rights to it. McGuire argues that Newman's struggle to gain creative ownership of the phrase is part of a greater history of exploitation, of black cultural production for the profit of non-black individuals. On top of examples of anti-blackness like the treatment of lip gloss, black femmes are still leaving the app due to these conditions every day. I will not put myself in a box. I speak how I speak, I react to things the way that I react to things, and regardless of how you like it or perceive it, that is who I am, that is me. I wasn't put on this earth to perform. Especially not for no white people. I was put on this earth to live unapologetically for my black ass self. Which is why I'm forever grateful for creators like Karma Carr, Miss Joe, Sarah Luger, Not Father Maria, Kava Random Black Girl, and Kony. I might have got some of those names wrong. But y'all keep my hope of quirky black creative women running the internet alive. What the algorithm does is amplify everyday commonalities of feminine projection onto these women. So I don't want to bash white women for the sake of uplifting black women, you know? White women may still be objectified heavily by a male audience for fitting into beauty standards. Insert Livy Dunn meme. Like being a black person on this internet, I go more than, I, I get more than enough, so I can't imagine what y'all go through. I can just throw a bonnet on, throw on some glasses, and I'm pretty and photogenic for the algorithm. While black femmes are expected to fulfill an unjust societal beauty standard in a myriad of different ways. They get hated on when their hair is too short, shamed for the complexion of their skin, and shunned for participating in interests they find joy in. So make sure to like, comment, and interact with femmes whenever you can. They really get it the worst. Thirdly, I got tired of standing. The I'm not touching you racism problem, which is widely spread throughout music talk. My first example that comes to mind is Diddy and Paige Zilba on TikTok. And of course this problem can be thrown onto creators who have profited in the participation of black culture because to center yourself in a black genre can have certain effects that we need to talk about. Let's talk about a chat. Ever since the inception of TikTok, black musical artists have been present in the form of TikTok sounds and organic Organically, a lot of artists have sprung up from the marketing of their own music and their own videos. Pink Panthers with her obscure appeal, Koyla Ray with her twerking videos, Aaliyah's interlude with her viral hit, It Girl, along with black men like Chris, Iaz, Jace, All of Opium, Lucky, Fiend, Fiend. Fe that's a joke, that's a joke. I, I know Travis Scott was already famous, okay, I, that's a joke. But this aspect of self-marketing from like a very down-to-earth personal TikTok creator kind of shtick has been commodified. These same influencers making their own songs and making their own videos scarcely go viral as much. And industry giants rely on everyday TikTokers in order to market their music. So influencers like Diddy Bob make a lot of money based on promoting and doing ad runs for media companies who want to hire and push these artists. And it's not like Diddy Bob is just like a, a, a young broke kid. He, he really makes money off this method. Well, we say we control the culture of TikTok. White faces take up the marketing roles of TikTok's branding. More and more content creators like Diddy Bop are springing up, even in the musical category. Ian being one of the newest white avatars of black culture, at this point working with Lyrical Lemonade and Lil Yachty got his start off of marketing on TikTok with a lot of comments shocked to find out that the man who made sounds like he's from Atlanta is a little white boy in some glasses. And it troubles me to know there's so much starving artists on the TikTok app, specifically because of how easily accessible it is as an app of black creativity. And since there's not much avenues to market yourself in the real world, they're forced to be undermined by white people who are worse than what they do, but born with the ability to be praised for being white. You see, the I'm not touching you racism problem solidifies a barrier of neglect of white faces and black spaces. If Diddy Bop is dancing to black music, wearing black clothes in a very nerdy white way, he becomes the awkward white kid and just like that. He can shield the culture vulture allegations by playing small little bean. I mean FaZe, the, the newest streaming group taking the world by storm, has even been spotted in sessions with him, which is wild when you consider the hundreds of other TikToks not deemed industry friendly because they're black people making black music, which ends up with them getting less opportunities than Ian 
Indian does. TikTok also has a weird way of censoring pro-black tags or discourse. Like all of this just reminds me of like the long and complicated history of race on this fucking app. So in 2020, there was a massive problem with white creators stealing from black content creators. And also back in 2020, TikTok would take your video down with the quickness. Like every time I opened this app, I had a violation. And when I say take your video down, I mean, you know, they would take black people's videos down primarily. And like rage baiting was huge in 2020 and 2021. 2021, I feel like that was the year of rage baiting on this app, especially when it came to race. Because a lot of the times, at least back then, the only way that you could get views if you were a black content creator was to stitch a white content creator who were running around recklessly and the app did not check them because TikTok don't be checking them. And then 2022, you had a lot of content creators who were trying to really educate about race. Me being one of them, you know what I'm saying? And that was a dumpster fire. So many black content creators were getting banned. It felt like every other video of mine was me trying to get somebody's account back. And so literally, like, we had to code switch. <laughs> Constantly. But yeah, when you see black people especially code switching and using words that you've never even heard of, it's because y'all be banning us. Because you don't want to take accountability for your privileged existence. And I said what I fucking said. Using Andre Brock's method of critical techno-culture analysis, first developed to study black Twitter, Peterson examines two challenges on TikTok that directly engage race through visual and critical techno-culture discourse analysis. To put these trends in context, Peterson documents surveillance challenges faced by black and other marginalized creators on TikTok. One example is a TikTok video from black creator Ziggy Taylor documenting that TikTok's content moderation system labeled phrases black support and black lives matter in his bio as inappropriate, but not the term white supremacy. Yeah, I'm fed up. I'm tired. I am a Neil. You can see it. Boom, accepted, fine, no issue. Let me delete it. I can say I'm anti, I'm not even gonna say the word out loud cause it irks me. Anti, boom, right here. You see it, accept it. God forbid I type this in. Let me get rid of that. Let me say word of the day, I'm a black man. What you think it's gonna say? Threat. I'm done. With greater context of racialized surveillance on TikTok, Peterson analyzes two TikTok challenges, the JoJo Pose challenge, in which black creators recreate photos posing like individuals in their towns or schools who had openly promoted racist rhetoric to the song Pose by Apollo Fresh, and the Vogue challenge, in which black and brown TikTok creators edited themselves onto the cover of Vogue magazine to highlight the historical lack of diversity in its publication. She proposes that these challenges counter hegemonic narratives of black identity and are a form of digital dark surveillance or digital strategies to inverse power structures under a system of racialized surveillance. Some of the key findings of these works mirror findings of prior works on black experiences online, including concerns of appropriation and outsider mockery of black individuals and stricter content moderation of black people. However, some of the findings are also unique to video sharing or specifically TikTok. The scale of capital built from non-black individuals, appropriation and copying of black individuals on the platform and the inversion of anti-black power structures by black creators both are more unique to TikTok. These unique elements suggest a greater analysis of black individuals' experience on TikTok is needed. Furthermore, these works complete their analysis by viewing TikTok content rather than engaging these creators. Of course. Hi, everybody. My name is Mariam Jai. Um, I'm 21 years old. I've been on the internet for about four years. Instagram is my main platform. I mostly do fashion content, beauty content, and yeah. I brought you on to discuss the challenges of creating, to creating editing, and being a figure online. What was your content creation journey like? I would say I didn't go into it um, thinking that it was going to be a journey. Uh, I just kind of did it to do it, you know, just posting myself. But it seemed to get a lot of attention, you know, from the way I dress to, um, you know, my face. I think people really like the way I look. Um, I get a lot of interaction from teenage girls mostly. So they kind of look up to me a bit when it comes to fashion, when it comes to beauty, like makeup, hair. I just kept going on 
with that still posting things that i want to post showing everybody you know how i curate my outfits how i style my hair you know just simple stuff like that and then slowly it just started getting you know traction traction i would have some posts on instagram you know blow up a little bit some posts on um tiktok blow up a little bit and then i was like all over pinterest which which most people you know recognize me from so yeah my content creation journey was kind of the same but to do it's like so young uh mm -hmm. i have to like give you like an applaud I, my content creation started like through three years ago at this point like on tiktok and then i started doing youtube videos two years ago uh definitely like the same thing like posting uh not really outfits more so like mm -hmm. a bunch of rants and like funny videos and all that but it's it's funny because the internet's so small like i saw your account i think like two years ago and yeah. i think that's when i first saw you and i and i saw you on pinterest before that and, mm. and and then when i saw like your account on instagram it was like <laughs> eight of my mutuals already followed you it's like the content creation space online is like very small which makes sense because like to have that much followers like not that much people are gonna garnish that much followers right yeah. but what you do um i have to applaud you for it because you are you are a big inspiration and i love that yeah. with your experience uh uh working you know as a content creator um have you ever come into like a racist situation with a fan because i know it's happened a lot with like uh that's happened a lot with me uh specifically on tiktok when i was a tiktok creator uh, but it was basically like a lot of it was a lot of normative racism like you know the microaggression comments uh mm -hmm. they evolve over the years like right now it's like why ends and like crash and mm -hmm. to describe black people yeah. but uh yeah back then i was getting called all those tiktok stuff in your experience uh how is that like so yeah definitely have gotten dms gotten comments very very hateful um you know i'm sure you can understand too you know we're both dark skin it seems like um we get targeted a little more than um you know other people um i had an instance where there were um comments under this picture that like blew up it got like seventy thousand likes um and it was like oh she looks like a man or mm. oh yeah it was so i was like okay and then a lot of people were like coming to my defense i, like, I would have obviously to not yeah yeah because um because you're I beautiful would... <laughs> thank you going i would say that there are a lot more positive comments than the hateful ones which i'm very appreciative of i love the people who follow me they always come to my defense whenever they see some you know bull in the comments i get uh comments like um you know like she's too dark comment like gorilla emoji comments you know that cole comments calling me cole and then i think especially the man comments stood out to me the most um because it was like a um it was like a dump of selfies of my stuff of myself right all of these like that i mentioned are coming from older men told that you know i can't tell if she's a girl or boy um in my comments and it's never women i i never see that it's never people my age it's it's older men which i find very interesting but how i dealt with it um you know we move like <laughs> I, we, like i i get dms all the time and i think just like if i were to focus on the negative ones which there are um i would like you know give them power you know give those mm -hmm. comments power give those situations power when there's so much positivity that mm -hmm. comes with like my platform and everything so yeah on the other hand have you ever come into like a race situation with like an app uh because i know when i was uh on tiktok and even sometimes on youtube i get mm -hmm. striked for um i guess like maybe sometimes like the way i talk or like mm -hmm. the ave i use or like mm -hmm. some kind of something i just get striked for and i'd be like i i didn't do anything here and that's actually mm -hmm. how my first couple tiktok accounts got like banned off the face of the earth inflammatory remarks when mm -hmm. i was just talking about anti-blackness and the second one was literally because i showed my shoulders and then they were like oh you're too revealing so, but in your experience um how's it been like with you um 
you know i don't really talk in my content because i i am shy like with talking that is a little scary for me so i've never personally gone through um you know a racist situation with an app but i do see like what you said a lot especially when um the topics are you know about palestine i have i'm in college you know i'm 21 um mm -hmm. I am a part of the Student Justice for Palestine Club and their page got taken down about three, four times from um, on Instagram, which is so insane because no other club page has like ever experienced something like that. And yeah, I just it's, it's just so it feels very intentional. It doesn't uh, feel like it's just okay this page just happened to get taken down three or four times you know for me personally no and i think it's probably because i kind of stay on the safer side you know i don't mm -hmm. i don't voice opinions that much if that makes sense this isn't written down but i just kind of want to ask you uh just because okay. experience of being a content creator uh i guess for us and like you know, dark skinned people uh, mm -hmm. being able to have a normative entry into some kind of some kind of platform hasn't really existed outside mm -hmm. of Hollywood for like the longest time. So like we're this is a very new thing, like the concept of micro niche, micro Internet influencers, like what they yeah. do online, their purpose and all that. And I will yeah. say that's very exciting. Right. And I'm very happy that someone like you um, was is given like a platform and able to, I guess, do whatever put push your art in the world in whatever forms mm -hmm. you want but in the ex experience of being a black content creator what's the joy of it honestly like i said before it's it's my younger audience you know the dms that i get um you know these are teenage girls we're, we're like basically in the same age group around you know i'm 21 you know, a little older but you know 16 17 18 year old uh talking about how i was such a huge like inspiration for them like through seeing me on my platforms they feel more confident about themselves and then when it comes to dark skin black girls you know teenagers i make them feel more confident put themselves out there post them themselves on the internet um dress how they would like um they mentioned that part like wow you make me feel more confident about my skin you make me feel more confident like as a dark skinned girl which is is so beautiful like it's really you know it, it really 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 touches my heart so mm. honestly that's that's definitely the best part <laughs> baby ariel Lisa and Ellen, Lauren Gray, Jacob Satorius, Cameron Dallas, Christian Hatchner, Sav Sotis, Airy, Mackenzie. To be honest, I, I don't know a lot of these people, but they've made a lot of money. And that money has some ramifications that we're going to get into and all that stuff. A lot of these names would go on to cement lasting careers with millions of dollars. And, you know, however, how they got to that fame is something that needs to be studied. I know it's hard to believe, but the concept of voicing over music on camera was actually coined on Musical.ly and dub smash one of them being of significance in a different way in accordance to its usage of the app but essentially the same thing you load it up you pick the song you do the dance easy enough usually these videos would include some impressive camera work movement over a number of transitions however for the sake of simplicity we're going to start with musically and then talk about the utility of an app like dub smash to marginalized artists a little bit later musically rose to prominence sometime in 2015 where the most popular short form app by far was vine and way behind it dub smash you forget that at this time this app was competing with instagram youtube twitter and lebron prime facebook Book. Notably, Vine and Dub Smash were by far the more blacker apps. The minstrel effect didn't really work on TikTok in the same way as lip syncing did for black creators on Musically. I define minstrelsy very loosely and with grace. See, minstrelsy is a performance for a white audience. Black people embody for quick clicks. Think Speed, Kai, Bruce, Flight Reacts, etc. Although Speed is becoming cool, I, I kind of f with it. And I have empathy for this kind of performance too. At the time, it seemed in the genre of entertainment, 
black artists thrived more algorithmically through self-degrading skits like King Bach did, rather than eccentric clips like Speed and AMP and Phase do right now, highlighted with the prominent rise of King Bach. We'll get into minstrelsy later though. Not to say that Musical.ly didn't have its fair share of cringe. It was, it was very much a primer app in terms of its form. And Vine was the same app, but like cooler. In a public sense, it was not getting stomped on and defecated on and, you know, smashed as much. It had the cool kids. <laughs> the cooler content creators were shifting digital content creation in very new and creative ways on Vine. Musically, in comparison, was always seen as an app for younger children. And even though the ripple effects of these white content creators remain profoundly under-researched, it's evident that YouTube's digital monolith of content revolved around the idea of musically being cringe. We could see this with the millions of views people like Rice Gum and Pyro Cynical garnished over their career. I mean, they got houses and cars and Lamborghinis and expensive clothes off of this. I was, Rice Gum was flexing that for us for a minute. A number of content creators doing commentary podcasts like Pyro Cynical, I am a pet, I mean, I'm Alex. Uh, Rice Gum and KSI may even owe their fame to the adjusting era of Musical.ly. Most of these YouTubers literally went from roasting kids to selling them a legalized overdose for $4.99. Chocolate Prime. This affected Musical.ly numbers too, uh, Harvard Case Sites. Musical.ly primarily targets at 13 to 18 year old teens. Now, I don't really listen to Nepo Babies, but I'm gonna trust Harvard's resource just this one time. I kind of saw it for myself, so. You got this one, white kids. Get, get her, get her done, white kids. And it's marketing very much walk the walk. Most of the boosted creators were kids under the age of 16, musicians, and girls that fawned over them. And what happened afterwards was a crowd of very young fans came in that were basically fawning over these creators. Now, Musical.ly was launched initially in 2014. And thankfully, we have an interview with Alex Zhu, co-founder of Musical.ly, in order to expouse for the chiefs. According to him, if you can bring people together, <coughs> Me before the <coughs> Hello Kitty BDSM party. <coughs> what Alex couldn't foresee was the community that this would have sprung forth. See, initially our computer savvy guy just wanted to build an algorithm which educated the masses. At that time, I got an idea. It was a one billion dollar idea, I thought, <laughs> right? which is to transform education and combine the idea of Coursera and the idea of Twitter into one product, um, making educational contents first on mobile, and bit size, short form. So we reduce the barrier to content creation as well as content consumption for education, right? So in the end of the day, we hope everyone can post educational contents, share the knowledge, and everyone can learn on this platform. It became a multiple, a multiple billion dollar business. But it turned to be completely failure. <laughs> And, and, and then, you know, we analyzed what are the lessons learned from this failure. We must, you know, learn from the failure and try to find a new direction. But what would really cement its popularity was Gen Z. See, there was a number of apps that were popular with Gen Z. Snapchat, Vine, Instagram, Flappy Bird, House Party. And no, I'm not laughing about the Flappy Bird part. You wouldn't believe me, but these phones with the original downloads were going for like 6,000 Canadian dollars. These apps laid down very important frameworks. Instagram taught us hot people can lead to a lot of clicks and likes and interaction and engagement. Snapchat taught us personal connection to people's lives can be monetized on a day-to-day -day short form basis. Vine taught us maybe we can combine all three of these things in a short form content creation style, which would turn into creating niche micro internet influencers. The everyone's in on it internet moments can thus be talked about on the town square in these people's comments. We can collectively meme funny sounds, the vine booms, maybe come up with our own, laugh with every scroll, watch regular people, become stars. It was the wild west of short form content creation, but Musical.ly's rise didn't come until they, in the same way as Vine, appealed to Gen Z. Musical.ly understood engaging with younger generations is a way to cement your legacy as a product. Creators like Baby Ariel, Jacob Satorius, and Cameron Dallas organically became the algorithm's Justin Bieber. By the way, all these creators were under 16, Jacob Satorius being 13 at the time of his blow up. There's a lot to say about what interaction and fame and all that dopamine 
what I mean, you can do to a young mind. But Jacob Sartorius took and ran with kind of the same marketing model that Justin Bieber did. Being a young white musician was a different experience in the social zeitgeist to Justin Bieber though, according to his time. I've been around for both of their blowups and TikTok unlocked a whole different type of paparazzi. See, when you're posting on a day-to-day -day basis, rather than dropping videos or little music videos or doing appearances here and there and relying on the paparazzi and press to be your marketing, you essentially can be contacted with at any time in a parasocial matter in the algorithm, which makes backlash so much more harsh hate campaigns so much more personally reifying and all that. Justin Bieber's publicity was seen in YouTube videos, Ellen interviews, paparazzi photos and footages. While Jacob Sartorius's happened in a digital vacuum, instead of mainstream industry coverage, Jacob Sartorius relied on Musical.ly's young base of content creators and publicity, be it in the form of hating content creators or common engagement. Constantly popping up in an algorithmic feed gave a different level of parasociality with the audience. This was the first niche micro internet influencer to break into the mainstream. Well, not really. I'd kind of say that was like Soldier Boy, but like Jacob Sartorius would become a visual blueprint for a number of other content creators who looked like him in a variety of different ways. And I tend to go lighter on him because he was like 12. But remember that black and POC content still thrived on Musical.ly. It was just mostly essentialized. What do you mean by that term? What do you mean by essentialized? I mean like watered down, like McDonald's at a downtown South Dakota watered down dry type beat. Popular rappers at the time like Future would see his hit. <laughs> Molly More commonly known as Mask Off by Future, be made into trends in the form of dances on Musical.ly. And a lot of camera tricks you see in the current TikTok age were invented on Musical.ly too. You know that those hand movements, they was doing that on Musical.ly. Dancing, but dancing as a trend, I'd more relate to artists like Ao and Teo. I remember them popularizing a lot of things like the Quan, like, you know, that pipe it up shit, that yeah, dating all the way back to 2000 Soldier Boy. So the way I look at it, building a community is very similar to running an economy. So there are a lot of economic policies you can learn in order to run the community. Building a community from scratch is like you just discovered a new land and you want to build economy, you want to build population, and you want people from Europe to migrate to your, to your country. And Instagram is Europe, Facebook is Europe. How can you do it? <laughs> Alex got his initial wish though, and the European content creators did come flooding in. Creators like Jacob Sartorius were not really that big until they moved over to TikTok and created that following. What Alex Zhu and the founders of Musical.ly did was essentially create a new type of content creator economy. See, the emergence of content creator economies inadvertently create new ways for niche micro influencers to tackle the medium on a certain app. TikTok's not the first industrial giant to create one of these online retention extraction modules. We saw how on Vine, the creator economy, led to popular white stars to emerge to prominence across apps like YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. This method was so successful, it helped to gentrify LA. And although these initial content creator economies didn't pay well initially, what they're useful for is clout or views. See, the aspirations of most content creators spans further than just recognition on the app that they're on. We, f we forget, for most big name celebrities, TikTok is only just becoming a viable way of marketing. Initially, you need big names to break the mold, like Selena Gomez's run on Musical.ly, inspiring big viners to migrate to flock to the app. But your tester creators need to have faith that their foothold will be solid on your platform. So creating a model based off of potential and giving initial stars loads of clout makes people that look the same as them, that are creatives, and see this as a platformic way to garnish more attention for their art to segue into this app and that's marketing babes this is your degree admittedly this was my generation but i was way too busy throwing ball in hoop and playing roblox to keep up with anything other than youtube and being beat for bringing home beats you know it's just immigrant vibes but musically was overly white filled with adolescent children and subjected to dunking videos from whatever bigoted minority phase could get its hand on that generation. Dub Smash was overwhelmingly black on the other end and with the same premise. And most of Musical.ly's trend
Kranz, Be It The Young Thug, Thief In The Night Dance, and a bunch of others have been stolen. And this is still a prominent issue to this day. There have been grievances and acts of rebellion against TikTok. In fact, Dub Smash has actually rolled out services like paying for a creator message, which help black creators have a more stabilized income, which is always nice because a lot of us aren't these people with Mercedes's man. I'm telling you this a facade. Now, online platforms in their current forms do contribute to disproportionate bans, restrictions, and bigoted engagement with marginalized artists. But how much of this is the app and how much of this is the people? After all, it's the person that has to hop on their phone and type out that comment, stitch a black video without any reference to the dance, use slang they have no business using. I'm saying we have to try to consume with some sort of consciousness. TikTok is becoming a mecca of black culture. And although you can have opinions on your creators, we watch people like Aaliyah's interlude go from our For You page to our TV. We watch Wisdom go from our For You page to Runways. We watch Kabi go from our For You page to the most followed at least for a while. And we continue to watch as the new generation invents trends, dances, sound bites, and memes in this little pocket dimension. This is exciting. Having avenues for a globalized exchange of art is exciting. I've literally seen some of the funniest, coolest, to most engaged, engaging moments across the diaspora. Whether it was C China, a British 19 year old, 1v9 billioning, all of the red pilling men trying to slut shame her and coming out on top. All we do is chill in your person, we rap about ops that you don't even have. These don't be too neaky, crap, run, upset, don't even have. Whether it was 10K cash literally making us all like. for the whole pandemic. Whether it was the cast of MHA being remixed to a then trending rap song. Shout out to Pixel Drink and the, and the black anime community. I've seen a lot of art and I'm very thankful for that. Thankful for the creators who go through the gratuitous time of scripting, editing, and providing for me to see it on my phone for like three seconds and decide if it's good or not. I know it can be easy to mindlessly scroll. It's easy to forget the person behind the screen is not a real content creator, subjected to algorithmic means of feasibility. Sometimes I scroll so long, I start to forget what, what consciousness feels like, but we have to think carefully about how our algorithm choices and code will disproportionately affect the future of black artists and art. How can we create a better atmosphere for the future of content creators who inhabit this app and any other online? And just like Miriam said before, the love is disproportionately felt. And sometimes I can get caught up in a hate comment while ignoring the hundreds of others supporting the video and the thousands of likes accumulating from the video. It doesn't stop the fact though that those comments still remain though. If I could read out every single one and vindicate the author's IP addresses, I may be tempted by the fourth African comment, but more so than the comment, the algorithm, the internet, and the creator are more than this pocket dimension. We're affected by this algorithm. We make decisions based on the swing of metrics. My thumbnails constantly change. My presentation style stays generally the same in terms of script and editing content. I may take risks, but I become the niche of Turb, and that niche has asterisks of black, which I'll have to consider when trying to be seen amongst white content creators who may be prioritized or deemed more suitable to algorithmic standards. To the line of code processing both of our videos. So don't be afraid to shuttle all your favorite creators, engage, reposts, all of that. What I want to see is everyone comment a couple of their favorite black ones. My personal ones getting me through the autumn season are Karma Carr, a university student who's funny as hell. Think Peace Tribe, a really good activist voice from Atlanta, Mustangs of a Crouton, funniest li life skin on the planet, Devilish Bree, Cartiza Star, C China, Pixel Drink, Lele, Hemlock Springs, Tony Bravo, Shrek's Dumpster, Anaya Cash, White Male Ego in a Blunt, Areka Wool. Give me your favorites. I want them commented. I want there to be a list of names pertaining to black creators. Tell me what you love about them. Let us share in the communal joy of creativity. Thank you so much for watching my video. Movie night is this Saturday at 6 p.m. This Discord is in bio now. Sub to the Patreon to help me. It would. This one was a really fun one to make. I left TikTok around like a two ish years ago. Haven't really gone back because of a lot of censorship and all that. So it was nice to like go back and dig up some old trauma. Say I love you to all the TikTok people and all that. Give my little flowers to that app because not that much people know how much black how much black content comes out of that app. And as always, I love y'all. Have an amazing day. I'll see you next time. Mwah.